What is good to you? Good to me is looking at what you have within you and the resources that you have and being able to help somebody else and I guess lending a hand. Welcome to Chasing Good, a circle group podcast with the aim to help us better understand the good that's happening in the world today. Thanks for tuning in and I hope you enjoy. Hello and welcome back to Chasing Good. Here with me today, we've got Matt Davey. Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for having me, mate. Good to see you. Mate, my absolute pleasure. Now, I have had the uh, pleasure of um, knowing Matt for a good couple of years now. Hey, we've, uh, we, we were on the Impact Boom Accelerator program together, um, both relatively early stages in our ventures, be it um, Circle Group and Mend. Um, and Matt um, and his brother Noah have created this incredible platform um, that has done and is doing some incredible good helping people through their their journeys and I um it was actually a bit crazy to me that I hadn't had Matt on the podcast yet but I wanted to have uh, catch up with him hear his story and share if, share some of his wisdoms of which he has many um so again Matt thank you for taking the time and joining us of course um, can we start with, I guess, what's your journey a little bit about uh, childhood through to today? Can you give us a bit of a snapshot of as to as to Matt? We can do that. Yeah, it'll be a long story. But <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I guess sort of a bit of an overview of me is I started off after university in the corporate space, uh, did a business degree, and then went and worked in commercial real estate for about six years. Thought it was the path that I was meant to take and sort of followed that journey of finishing uni, getting a job, going down the traditional path of this is what success looks like. And at the time I thought it was what I wanted to do. And I got to 2018 and was living down in Melbourne working for a big company, thinking that I was happy, thinking that it was what my life was meant to look like. And I was diagnosed with brain cancer. And it came as a big shock, I guess. Cancer is a shock for anybody, but um, in your early 20s in particular, it kind of hits extra hard because you get to a point and think, what does this mean for my life? What does this mean for my career? Is everything over as soon as I have a diagnosis? And I got pretty overwhelmed, to be honest, and it hit me hit me in lots of different ways. Um, I had to move back in with my parents and leave Melbourne, leave sort of the life that I'd started to create for myself to really change course and really look at doing something different. So went through the treatment, went through another diagnosis. I got diagnosed with epilepsy a couple of months after the cancer, which was really challenging. And I guess, yeah, it, it was... It was just not what I was expecting at 23 and it wasn't what anybody around me was expecting either. So the course of my life changed very dramatically sort of overnight. And I'd gone from being this really healthy person per se, going to the gym every day, working a traditional job and just there being this huge shift. So after I'd had treatment, I went back to work in a part-time capacity and thought, that's what I'm meant to do. This is sort of what life looks like now. I have to go back to the past. And I think anybody, when you go through a major life event, kind of tries to understand what it means. And I thought, this will be fine. I'll just go back to what I know. But very quickly, I realized that it wasn't a realistic thing to do with my health, but also just in general with having some sort of purpose in my life. And... Yeah, it's, it's actually quite hard to talk about just because sort of I talk about it quite often and I guess people know parts of my story but don't necessarily know it as a whole. Um, and yeah, I just I got to a point where I'd gone to a health retreat at the end of 2021, which I try and do just to kind of take some time out and look at my life a little bit more holistically. And I started to think what was important to me what was important in terms of my work and how could I change the direction of, of my life, I suppose. Um, and I started to think about what was something that I really struggled with during my journey with cancer, with epilepsy, sort of with my mental health as whole, like as a whole. And I just decided I need to do something that brings me meaning and purpose and could potentially help other people in the process as well. So something that I really lacked through my health journey was finding support. 
and having people around me that could kind of give me a little bit of sense of direction and just information in terms of sort of moving forward. So I started to build and design MEND, which is my health management and insights platform that I designed with my brother Noah, who you know very well from the Impact Boom program as well. And yeah, it just kind of became this thing where I came back and resigned from my job, which was terrifying at the time. Um, and yeah, just really started this journey over the next two and a half years of building and designing something completely new. I don't have a health background. I don't have, you know, I have a business background, but I'd never started my own company. So we sort of went on this journey together, Noah being a software engineer and me with a sort of business background. We worked together to bring this product to life and yeah, and really just work towards trying to help people that lived with cancer or chronic illness. I can't begin to imagine how hard that would have been and kind of the, the journeys that I, I, the, the journeys within and kind of each place of realization that it that you've had to kind of go through um, to and, and how you've had to shift and kind of change those actions. I, I, I find it incredibly inspiring how you were able to take, you know, what is subjectively a very difficult experience and then take that and as inspiration for yourself or motivation for yourself to, to, to do good in the world. And that piece I always find to be very, I suppose, kind of fascinating understanding those key drivers for you because, you, you know, it's in, in, interesting as we started the conversation, you kind of, you mentioned life and career about those kind of parallel um, journeys that, that you were on at the beginning and then how that's that's shifted. What's been, what were those motivators? Can you talk to me about how that realisation process of, you know, obviously coming back to life, finding that purpose, where did that come from? It probably came from a desire to have meaning and I think when you go through a big shift in your life, whatever it is, whether it's something traumatic to do with your health, to do with anything sort of personal, you really reflect and think about those things. And in the beginning with MEND, it was almost like a selfish thing because it was almost like I needed to and wanted to have something for myself. I wanted to have something where I could continue to learn because when I'd gone back to work, I was very much put in this box of being met with cancer. And that was really hard because all of the people around me either felt sorry for me or had given me these opportunities because it almost was out of obligation. They're like, obviously, something horrible has happened. We're going to support you. But I was just at work because I needed to be at work and I needed to have something to fill my days. But I realized that I wanted to keep learning. I wanted to keep kind of pushing forward in life rather than just doing something just because. And in a way, I'm, I'm really lucky because most people work because they need to pay the mortgage, because they have to do X, Y, Z, and they have responsibilities. And I have those things too, but I don't have kids. I don't have a partner. I don't have those things where I'm necessarily responsible. So I got to be a little bit selfish and think, I have the capacity to make some change and I have the capacity to learn and do something new. And sort of having this project that was in my head about making change within the cancer space meant that I could kind of have a new focus, continue to learn and work with my brother on something that was, you know, not traditional. It wasn't something that everybody was going to do. And yeah, I just decided that I guess the motivation was really around doing something different, doing something good and just finding a new path where I didn't have to necessarily be at work for the sake of being at work. Mm. That's a, a fascinating piece. That that realization as you as you go through, was there a process that you followed when you, ha I guess, going from decision to ideation, or was the idea part of the inspiration as well? It was probably a combination. I definitely didn't follow a process. It was very much centered around my health and how things were looking. And when I left work in twenty twenty one for the last time sort of leaving corporate, my epilepsy was the worst it had ever been. It was 
completely taking over my life. I was having, you know, really big seizures every month without fail, almost like predictable. I knew that they were going to happen. And it was from this level of stress and sort of, I guess, even uncertainty. And my body was reacting in a way that my health just absolutely ran my life. So I didn't necessarily have a process in terms of shifting from work to the startup space or work to mend. It, it didn't really happen like that. It was just an idea that came from wanting to do something new, wanting to do something good and trying to find a solution for the problem that I'd been facing the whole time from 2018 up until 2021 when I decided to start Mand as a full-time gig. Um, but yeah, definitely not a process. It was literally just kind of coming to terms with, okay, I have to do something different. What's it going to look like? And then I just had to take the plunge straight away. Incredible. Um, can you tell me about the problem? So like, let, let's talk through the journey of men. So like problem, ideation, solution, um, current state. Yeah, we can do <laughs> that. That's okay. Yeah, of course. I'll um, prompt you along the way. <laughs> yeah, that no, sounds good. Um, the biggest problem I saw when I was kind of designing MEND before I even had a name, it was about supporting people that lived with a chronic health condition. More recently, it's turned into more of a cancer-focused product. But the idea that when you're diagnosed with a condition, diagnosed with cancer, whatever it might be, you're overloaded with information. You're constantly going to appointments, you have different medications, you have a different person in every single area of the hospital. Um, for me at that point, I had 15 specialists. So you imagine even having 15 employees and thinking, how am I gonna keep track of these people? What have they said to me? What are the outcomes from each session? And how can I you know, work towards better health outcomes when I don't really even know what's going on? And the onus around health is always around clinicians or always around big pharma. It's never focused around consumers. And that's definitely a financial related decision. That's why there isn't more support for consumers and patients per se. But I, I looked at that. That was my problem. It was that I wasn't getting the right support. I wasn't understanding my health. And as a result, I couldn't really be in control and have better health outcomes. So I kind of thought, this is the issue for me. I pitched the idea to my brother, the software engineer, Noah, and we kind of had a conversation and said, I think it's important that we speak to other people that have also gone through chronic health or are also living with cancer. And we started to do some user testing because, you know, the problem that I face might not necessarily be what other people are facing. It might just be an individual experience. Um, but very quickly we spoke to, you know, over a hundred people and it was pretty unanimous that everybody was facing the same issues around not having support, not understanding their health in general, and trying to keep track of things was a huge issue. So our solution to that at a large scale was to build a digital product that people could access for free. And men sort of came to life through us designing this, iterating the product with, you know, with co-design and working with other people that had also experienced it, talking to clinicians as well, saying, you know, how can this be effective for you? How can it be effective for patients? And sort of bringing it all together to, you know, I guess the end product, which was when we built MEND and launched in April last year, so April 2023. And we're now at the point where the product exists it's in the world we have about 700 users um, and it remains a free product which was really really important to us when it came to sort of conversations around funding and commercialization and things like that um, but yeah the journey was about 18 month process from sort of having the idea through to launching the product and now we're about a year past that so we're sort of you know trying to understand what comes next as we're yeah in the market now per se Hey, those who have started businesses or created um, such things before will be able to totally empathise with just how bloody difficult it is to do something like that, to create a, to find a problem in a market that is quite large, to get yourself to a position where you can take, you can leave your job and then create a solution and a product, mind you, which is technically very difficult to do and not 
not an easy process in itself um even if you're a software developer <laughs> like, like that, that's yeah we can a, ask Noah that question but. <laughs> yeah, like so um and, and it's a and it's a, a a beautiful app as well like for just for even from a ui and ux perspective it's, it's kind of it's it's built beautifully and seamlessly and and it's so customer centric focusing on the things that it, it's so evident i suppose when using it that you have you've built it with the user so heavily in mind and i suppose that's such a strong reflection of your own lived experience and knowing so deeply what it is that you need um are you proud of that i'm definitely proud of that i think it's really important to have the co-design element and to sort of think about how important lived experience is and how important that is when it comes to building products and you know building a company with us as well so yeah definitely proud of it it's still got a long way to go but i'm proud of sort of the fundamental part of you know what we've done yeah no totally fair well it's 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 never enough, is it? There's always there's always something. There's wrong, always things but, to be done, yeah, but I think uh, that you know when you have a business, that's always how we approach it because you always want things to be better. You always want things to be customer centric. I think for the most part, especially people you know like us, where we work in the impact space or in a space where we are trying to build something, not necessarily just for financial gain, where it has another element to it. So yeah, for sure, things can always be better, but the idea of just, you know, starting something positive and doing something that's bigger than you is really important. Normally I hold off a little bit more, but I'd like to try and I think dive into this um, as, a, as a whole and and kind of talking to the, the good and the positive and, and, and what that means. I think you've obviously been through some of you you've you've traveled some of the hardest paths to kind of be where you are to to have the knowledge base that you do what is good to you i've spent the last few days thinking about this question from where i've listened before but i think good to me is looking at what you have within you and the resources that you have and being able to help somebody else and just putting your hand out in whatever way that looks like and I guess lending a hand, shall we say, in not so many words, but for me in the cancer space, in the health space, I've seen how hard it can be being somebody that's lived with cancer. And the things that I can do is I can build a product to help people have a better health journey and reimagine the way that that looks. So for me, what I can do is I can give that back. And to me, that's good, you know, Everyone is going to be very different with, you know, the resources and the type of things that you can give to somebody else. But good is being able to support other people and be able to use your resources for good in general, you know. It's interesting because I, I hear you with that and, you know, good is me building a product or using the tools within me to build a product to help people. You didn't have that capability when you first started. That, that wasn't something that you had within you per se but i suppose can you tell me about that then how how is it that you've been able to create the motivation within yourself to build a tool build a company you know as you said you had business experience but you never built your own business you've 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 undertaken a a blind journey yes you can say that um i think I think everybody has it in them to do something different and has it in them to do something that they're passionate about. Um, motivation is definitely tricky when you have a company and when you're sort of pushing up against barriers that exist. Um, and we've had this conversation before, barriers that exist are always around money, are always around sort of commercialising a business and commercialising a product. Um, but I think motivation for me is just seeing that life can change so quickly and at 23 my life got turned around completely and it wasn't what i thought my life would look like but i could take what i learned and turn that into something positive rather than sitting in this kind of sadness and disappointment of realizing that my life didn't look the way that i thought it was going to be and I didn't have a huge job and I didn't have all of this money or all of this success and, you know, the ego part of us. 
but I think that motivation is that I'm a people person. I want to understand people, how they operate and how my experience can help somebody else. So sure, I didn't know how to, you know, have a conversation with the CEO or build a website or have conversations around so many different things. But I did have it in me to ask questions and to learn and to put myself in situations that maybe I was a little bit uncomfortable with um, and just and take them for what they were to sort of grow as a person, collaborate with other people and put myself out there so that I could build something good, something that was meaningful and every single day is filled with learning and filled with knowing that I'm going to be able to help even if it's one person, if it's thousands of people, amazing. If it's, you know, however many people MEND ends up reaching, that's always the goal, you know, in life is to help as many people as possible. But the fact that I can wake up and get an email from someone and say, this app's been able to help me manage my appointments and ask better questions to my doctors to help me get through the day. And as a cancer patient, when you're sat at home on your own, not feeling like you have any support, that means something. It's not something that, you know, is big, glitz, glamour, you know, something that people want to post about on Instagram, but it's something that people actually get impact from. And that's important. It's interesting talking about the motivation piece because, you know, these intrinsic motivations and recognising the changes of those motivations that um, you have, you know, because you don't necessarily have that financial reward. You don't get the... The different level. How has you know to to, to throw a number of seven hundred around is um, you know it lacks context as most data does, but that's seven hundred individuals mm. um, with some form of chronic illness that you are able to make an impact to on a day to day basis to 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 help them. You know that type of motivational change did you ever expect that you could kind of be at that stage did you ever did you comparing the how your motivations were laid out before and now do you think the do you, do you think the feeling is better in terms of being able to help 700 people or well, you know how you feel now versus how you were on your previous journey um i think being able to help 700 people is amazing, but I didn't really have any expectations when I went into it. Not having had a business before, you kind of assume that things will work in a certain way. And then when you launch, it's very much up to other people to sort of engage with you or to come and give you feedback on the app or think, you know, I like this, I don't like this. And Noah and I were really just focused on bringing something to market that was positive, that was good, like we said. Um, but yeah, I didn't really know what to expect from the experience. And, you know, 700 is great. 700 people's lives that can be changed through a product is is amazing. But like I said before, there's still a long way to go with where we're at because we want to continue to help more people. With regards to, I guess, your own mental health journey through this, I like, and I've been quite public, I suppose, about how difficult I found it to start start and run a business and just the, the general hurdles that you kind of go to and the day-to-day stresses and, and how much that weighs on you. I have these feelings without having gone through and and dealing and without having gone through and having had to deal with um, chronic illness. Uh, how have you managed your own mental health through this stressful journey? Because it is bloody hard to do. And that's, and, 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 you know, and I'm sitting here from a position of privilege. Um, how have you managed it for yourself? Every day is pretty different, to be completely honest with you. Like I'm here today talking to you and most of the time people will be like, how's it going? How are you? And at the beginning of this week, I was having a terrible week. I really struggle with my mental health. It's been something that has sort of always been in background, but ever since I kind of had my diagnosis, found out that I had epilepsy and have kind of worked through the process of managing those different conditions, my mental health has been really, really challenged. Um, And it's something that I'm not 
necessarily ashamed to talk about and not necessarily against talking about, but I think that it's something that you have to be actively aware of and actively take steps to manage it all the time for me individually, but also as somebody with a business and working in a space where there's all those other stresses around finances, trying to keep things up and running, et cetera, et cetera. But for me, it's just finding those little habits to try and keep myself motivated, to keep myself in a good headspace. Um, and for me, it's always around doing little things. So it's about going for a walk in the morning. It's about meditating, reading, all the things that they tell you that you should do. Um, but that works for me. You know, it, it's important exercising, finding ways to really balance work if I'm having a really, really bad health week. So with my epilepsy, if I have a seizure for the rest of the week, I might be out. I might not be able to function or think clearly or whatever it looks like. And I just have to accept very, very clearly that that's okay. And it's important to be able to work and show up and do all of those things. But it's really important to also take rest when you need to and not feel guilty about it. Because when you are taking rest, you know, a lot of people will think, it's lazy or it's not necessarily very productive, especially as somebody that runs a business. Um, but I've just come to that realization that the only person that I need to prioritize at the end of the day is me, because if my cup's completely empty, I can't serve anybody else. I can't work effectively with Noah. I can't show up to talk to you today if I've had a really poor week. And just finding different ways to look after myself and also just prioritizing what I need at the time. So I'm lucky again, you know, with men, when you run your own business, in my case anyway, I can have, you know, a couple of days off to just decompress. And then when things are, you know, full throttle, I can be at 100%. But just, yeah, mental health is so important and it's so important to acknowledge it and just constantly keep working at it as well because it's not something that, is constant it's like there's always a change and there's always things that are you know coming in waves are there any resources or kind of pro I, I suppose processes you've followed because i know like from for myself as an example it's taken me quite a long time to find the rhythm that works for me to manage my own mental health journey and i consider myself very lucky in that in that in that space but i do work very proactively to keep it good yeah um and that's taken me a long time to get to this point was there any kind of processes or resources or particular lessons that you've learned along the way that um stick out or um probably i think with me i've been similar to you it's taken a long time to kind of find my rhythm and accept where i'm at so i've been lucky per se um but it's been a learning curve so in terms of resources there's always things out there when i was diagnosed you know you ask you ask one of your doctors and say how can i find support for this how can i find support for that whatever it looks like but it was actually a bit of a challenge when i first got diagnosed because i'm in this kind of different kind of age group so i'm not in their kind of you know young people age group but i'm not also in an older age group, if that makes sense. Not very eloquent, but like I'm in this kind of group called AYA, which is like adolescent young adult. So the doctors kind of treat you like you're an adult that you can do things yourself, which, you know, I'm capable of doing it, but they don't necessarily offer up very much support when it comes to, you know, finding a psychologist or speaking to an organization like Canteen or somebody like that, where you can go and speak to other people get resources, get information and kind of connect with other people that are going through something similar. So I found that hard because it was very much all on me when I was having a bad day or I couldn't remember this, that or the other from an appointment. I had to proactively ask and find my GP and say, how can I speak to a psychologist? How can I find these things? Because they weren't being offered to me. And I knew that my mental health was the key to sort of getting through my journey and kind of proactively being able to manage that. So yeah, there's always resources available, but I think that in my case, I didn't have the support that I necessarily needed. I was lucky I had my parents, I had friends that were supportive, but when it came to bigger things, it was very much me trying to find it, which was also a motivation for MEND because I could see what it had done to me and kind of feeding that into the app and kind of 
putting resources there. So if somebody was using it, they could think, oh, I can contact, you know, Beyond Blue or I can contact Cancer Council, whoever it might be, being able to find that very easily without kind of having to go through a frantic search when your life is already kind of all over the place after a diagnosis. The mental resilience you must have. Depends on the day. (laughs) (laughs) Well, well said, but you know, to, 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 I, I almost disagree with that though, because you know, the day is not a reflection of the lifetime. You know, it's a, it's a moment in time, but, but the person you are is a reflection of, you know, those moments that have created you and what you are now is obviously, you know, incredible. And having done what you've done and created what you've created off the back of what you've experienced is such a, is such, is such a noble um, and wonderful thing. If you, I, I, in the context of health, I suppose, because it is such a big beast, you know, there's so much, um, there, there is, so particularly in the not-for-profit space, there is so much kind of attention in that area and there seems to be quite a lot of noise so it is interesting to hear about the, the kind of patient um, side not necessarily being being focused and kind of finding that gap. What would you say are kind of like the core areas of or the core issues within within the health space, apart from just like what, what you've seen? Is this is this something that's a bit of a bit of a trend across the industry? Or I think there's there's definitely a trend in terms of them being a little bit like risk averse so when it comes to the health system in general like broadly speaking they're very against sort of digital support tools or if they do have digital support tools they don't really know how to implement it in an effective way um so what we found with mend is there was this element of trying to co-design products that worked for consumers that were just a tick box so I won't name any names in particular, but when health services are designing something, they'll think, okay, we have to get a consumer on board so we can tick the box. And that consumer might say to them, something that I need is a digital resources. I need to keep things in a central place so that it's easier for me to make decisions, which is exactly what we do with MEND. And they might say, the other nine people in the room, that's not relevant, we don't need that. But none of those people have a chronic health condition. None of those people have cancer. None of those people necessarily care about the day-to-day reality of what support needs to look like. They just have in their mind, at a larger scale, profitability. What they already know, they don't like change, all of those things. And they kind of approach it the the traditional way because it's so much easier, because they can just follow the path. It's very linear. And the reality is health is not linear. Life is not linear. And approaching health in that way means that change isn't going to happen. You know, things are going to be very, very stuck in the past and, you know, archaic because the health system isn't utilizing digital, isn't using technology to move forward. And it's something that I think will happen over the next few, you know, next few decades with AI, with tech, with all of those things. But there needs to be like, you know, systemic change at a larger level because that's what I see the problem is. I see the problem as people not using and utilizing technology for good. They're just kind of ticking boxes. They're not looking at co-design and actually taking people's opinions seriously. Um, And yeah, I, I guess it's so broad. Health is so broad. And that's why with us, we've sort of really focused in on health tech, tech for good, and, you know, niching it down to a chronic health app where we can kind of help people with one area it's obviously not going to help every single person but it is going to be able to provide like a fundamental base to kind of work off and you know for hopefully people to continue using or building on a bigger scale as well sort of through our partnerships why do you you think the industry is slower to move in general i think the health space is just is very stuck in its ways it's every clinic you go to is going to have a different system. They're concerned about privacy. They're concerned about data, which is all, you know, very, very, very fair. Like, of course, we're all concerned about those things. But I think that it's just something that will take a long time to change because when people don't understand something, 
it, it's much harder to make decisions around things you don't understand. And, you know, we can talk and have this conversation and be agile and adaptable, but a lot of people in the health system are a lot older or they're a lot more resistant to that change. And when I spoke to a few clinicians when we were co-designing MEND, it was a lot of younger doctors where they were saying, we see that this is an issue. We see that digital is the way forward, but they don't necessarily have the power to make the change just yet. But as things change and you find people that are more adaptable, those things will start to come into effect as well. So I think it just takes time. Mm. It's... um. It is tricky the the kind of the, the balance of power and how that um, how that shifts. Uh, the med tech space is a, is a is a fas- fascinating one in itself, and I know that there seems to be quite a lot of I suppose investment going into that area, and the best way to um, I guess create create innovation is to follow the money or to have have money flow into the innovative spaces. Um, commercializing this this product i know that we've spoken about this um in in depth off of the of the past making it free that's a very um noble thing to do but um quite a lot of listeners might not know i suppose just how strategically disadvantage like dis- uh, strategically um difficult you're making it for yourself. It's a bit more of a challenge, yeah. To do that. Um, yep. Not just strategically. Pretty much di- more difficult across every every, every avenue. But that was so important to you. Can you talk to me a little bit more about that? Because there is obviously this this sum of money that is big cut that is available to you if you can kind of pull a few levers and make it work in a, in a different way. Why is it so important that the app is free? A and B. Um, how did you go about continuing, like leveraging that motivation continuously? Because you would have had shiny objects dangling themselves in front of you the whole way along the journey, surely. I think there was the motivation to make the app free, just out of a pure ethical standpoint. Noah and I both discussed that people living with cancer or chronic health don't have the funds, don't have the resources to access something like this, but why should they not be supported? Why should they not be given a product for free? And I guess it was pretty naive early days because we wanted to approach it that way. It's not really a business perspective. It's not something that you're necessarily going to make money from. And when we went to, you know, pitching to venture capital funds or private investors, they all asked us that question. That was the main thing. And we said, well, this product itself isn't necessarily going to be a commercial product, but as we kind of work through and understand different avenues as part of it, there can be other ways that we can commercialize. And we have strategic partners that we're working with now on other projects where you know money is involved and it can actually be a different opportunity and a different approach. But it was just, yeah, it was really important that we, that we did something good. So like I said, a little bit naive, but as our first business, it was just the way we wanted to do it. Um, but it is hard because for two and a half years, I haven't had a salary. And there's always those things in the distance when you speak to a, an investor and they say, well, if you just charge people this money or if you just change what you're doing just a little bit, we can give you millions of dollars. And of course, that's exciting, but it takes away fundamentally from what we're doing because if we wanted to make money, we wouldn't build this cancer product. We would build something that is generic, that doesn't necessarily mean anything. You know, there's lots of different types of businesses. There's businesses that are impact driven, that are for good, that still make money, of course. But with this specific product and project, it was so important to me that people were able to access it. Because if I was going to go out and put, you know, a figure on it per month what about the person that desperately needs this that has nobody else to support them that could use mend and it make their life easier that's what i wanted even if it was one person so sustainably as a business model it might not look like you know a traditional business but i know that 
the way we've kind of structured it and are moving forward now, we have a lot more opportunity with people that we are partnering with, with universities, research orgs, things like that. Um, but yeah, it, it is hard to stay motivated and kind of keep on track because there are so many factors to consider. And when it's just two people running a business as well, it's hard to hard to kind of rationalize all of the other other parts and keep yourself going. So yes. <laughs> the ethics in money and charging piece is a is a fascinating psychology and consideration in itself because you know there's the um price psychology is something that comes to mind um people don't necessarily value something as much if it is free or at a lower price even though you're even though the intent is to provide that um and then the the concept of guilt for charging um all, all of these things um as you know i've kind of thought deeply about myself because they're the same kind of frustrations do you have a general feeling around ethical charging or you know commercialization of impact driven initiatives in general let's say not just yours but do do you have an opinion on 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 that area or is that something that you think is is okay and and or running your own business you know wh- where do you sit on the, where do you sit i suppose on the scale of it's okay to make money versus not i think it's a hundred percent okay to make money i think that there are so many businesses out there that do good things that earn money and that's how business works and for me it's honestly just this venture because it's so personal like this business is my baby but as we kind of move forward, like I'm in the middle of the journey of my first business. So when we build another product, it would definitely be commercially focused. It's just the way we've approached Mend has been slightly different and, you know, is something that we're, we're working through. I'm not here as somebody that's, you know, at the peak of having a huge scale up. I'm here as a person that has done something for good. And I think that everything has value and to have a sustainable business, you do have to make money. So, you know, for companies like Calm or Headspace or people that focus in the mental health space, there's huge value in it. People are going to use those instead of going to therapy and that works for them because it's more affordable, it's more practical and it works in a certain way and that's how that business model works. So 100%, I'm on the scale of you have to make money to be a sustainable business. But there are other things that are passion projects and I think that that's where men sits when i speak to people that give me feedback whether they're advisors or they're people that we partner with people have so much excitement and love for men because of our story because of us being so passionate about it and i think that when you hear that and you hear that people are invested in what we've done that's really important because people do want to do good and people want to make money as well but there's that balancing act in between and that's you know that keeps me going as well because it's just it's learning where you sit as a business and sort of how you move forward so big lessons all the time absolutely and that's such a to kind of have that realization i suppose that you know this is this is a passion project and I'm going to spend a lot of my time creating this thing that I'm not necessarily going to get any tangible um, value from, yep. per se. It's a, it's a sacrifice that is, um, is pretty hard to comprehend and v- almost impossible to comprehend at the initiation, I would suggest. Do you think if you had known just how much sacrifice it would take at the start you would still have done it i think so yeah i think um i might have approached things a little bit differently um just in terms of sort of maybe flipping things around a little bit and thinking about the commercial model versus everything else and potentially shifting the way we approach building the product but at the same time it's been such a journey where i've been able to learn i've been able to work with my brother and i've been able to meet so many amazing people through the process that why would i not want to do that you know you could build a company that 
is you know hundreds and hundreds of times bigger and super super successful but it might not mean anything and I think for me it's just been I've been really really lucky to be in a position where I've been able to do this and I'll have conversations with friends of mine that are doctors or lawyers or have you know typically successful jobs where people think that that's what success looks like and they'll say to me oh Matt I need advice I need to understand like how did you start a business how do you kind of sustain this so when you hear people saying that that are earning you know four five hundred thousand dollars a year it kind of makes you think am I doing the right thing are they doing the right thing what does success look like and I 100% would do it again because I've helped people. 700 people have been able to experience something that I've built with my brother and we've put something good into the world just through my lived experience, through his knowledge as a software engineer and I've been able to grow, learn and, you know, just do something very different. So I would definitely do it again. What would you say were the biggest lessons that you've learned along the way? take as much advice as you can possibly get um at the beginning when i had the idea of mend i thought that it was the most amazing thing that i'd ever heard of of course because when you design something you think this is amazing why has nobody done it before and i remember going to a meeting with noah very early days maybe three or four months in and we went and spoke to a venture studio who said to us have you considered a b c d e and i was like oh yeah, that's fine that they're giving me advice, but this is already pretty good. And their advice was all around co-design and working with people and having research. And it was the most valuable piece of advice because I've realized through the process and through consulting work that I do as well in the health space, how important speaking to people is and understanding what their needs are rather than just thinking what my problem is, is, you know, the be all and end all. Um, so yeah, it was, it was really important for me to have advice and to connect with people doing the programs like Impact Boom. And we did a program last year called Lumina X, which was a healthcare, health tech accelerator. And just being able to get guidance from other people that had already been through a similar thing or started their own business, um, that was something, you know, that was huge. So just taking away those lessons of connecting with people, asking questions and not necessarily being afraid to question your ideas and sort of, you know, take a different perspective as well. What's next? Big question. Hmm. Um, at the moment, we're working with some new people. So we originally were working with some not-for-profits that wanted to work with MEND and sort of integrate it as part of their business, which was really exciting. Um, but we're currently working with a few other people that work in the research space that are looking at using MEND to sort of partner with other people that I can't talk about at the moment. Um, but yeah, just sort of What's next is really just finding a permanent home for MEND where we can continue to grow with our values, but be somewhere that has funding. So, um, yeah, that, that's sort of what we're really passionate about. Um, Noah's moving overseas to continue working in the startup space. Um, and my focus is sort of around strategic partnerships. But um, I guess what's next for me is kind of continuing my journey in consulting within the healthcare space um, and just yeah continuing to sort of advocate for for change for good and making sure that people that are in more marginalized groups with disability you know within the chronic health space have a voice and continuing to sort of find ways that those people can be supported as well let's say um just a small task just a small task <laughs> <laughs> Do you feel that pressure? No, because it's something that I'm passionate about. I think if if I didn't care about it, it would be huge pressure because you're kind of turning up to work to do something that people need you to deliver on. But it's very much on my terms at the moment and I choose projects that I'm passionate about to work on. When I get to speak, um, I work with a group called Champion Health Agency and get to pick projects that are important to me, whether they be through Queensland Health or with large not-for-profits and things like that, speaking at Cancer Congress, things like that. I get to choose things that actually matter to me. So I don't necessarily feel the pressure. Um, 
I feel pressured to say the right things and, you know, deliver things, but also it makes an impact and that's what's important to me. So, yeah. yeah. Matt, you know how much I think you are an incredible and wonderful human being. I um, am glad and feel privileged that I have had the opportunity to um, share now with um, everyone else so more people can see how incredible you are too. And I also must shout out Noah as well. Of course, yeah, he's the brains behind everything. He is just an He he was just just a... um, the 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 Davy Boys are um, a dime and a dozen. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful human beings doing incredible things for this world, and it is just a uh, absolute privilege to sit down with you, catch up as always, but th- um, to hear your story um, in depth. And thank you so much for sharing it with our audience. And mate, um, yeah, thank you again. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate it. Thanks so much for listening to Chasing Good, a Circle Group podcast. Our mission is to shift the world closer to kindness, sustainability, awareness and action. We hope you enjoyed. Until next time.